Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, next presentation in our Dairy Ingredient Fundamentals webinar. In this section, we'll be discussing the functionality of dairy ingredients with a particular emphasis on the five dairy products mentioned earlier, the whey protein concentrates, milk protein concentrates, etc. My name is Tom Gearn and I'm a research program manager here at the center and together with Nathan Price, uh, we will be looking at the key functional characteristics that are most commonly associated with dairy ingredients. This webinar will also show you how these functional characteristics are linked to both cost and performance in food applications. So to kick things off, let's take a quick look at why we use dairy ingredients in the first place. There are a number of answers to this question uh, and I'll briefly run through the list that I have on the slide here. Uh, the first of which is that the dairy products can contribute solids non-fat to a food product. As the name implies, uh, milk solid non-fat is the non-fat portion of milk. It includes proteins, carbohydrates, and minerals. Quite often, products will have a regulatory requirement for a milk solid non-fat content, such as in ice cream. Uh, then when we look at the cost component, we see that dairy ingredients are often cost-effective uh, ingredients within food products. Uh, volatility does occur, but in general, the effect on cost is quite predictable. When we look at uh, clean label, from a clean label perspective, we see that you know, dairy ingredients are natural products. They're well accepted by consumers uh, and have been in wide use for a long time. The nutritional aspects of dairy are also well understood, uh, which is no surprise given that milk really is nature's ultimate food. And then finally, functionality. Dairy ingredients, as you'll see, uh, are able to define the sensorial properties, shelf life characteristics, and appearance of every food product that uses them. And that's what we'll concentrate throughout the rest of this presentation. So let's start this review of functionality by briefly telling you what functionality is not. Uh, functionality is not a specification or a technical data sheet. The information on a specification or a technical data sheet is the basic amount of detail you need to understand the product you have made or received. It contains basic compositional details, microbial analyses, as well as some other typical characteristics that let you know your product is of a certain legal standard. And while this information is important, it doesn't provide any real insight into how a particular product will function in any given application. Your QA department will need this specification information to ensure that basic standards of compliance are being met, but your other departments, such as research and development, operations, and even sales teams, will need to understand more about how the ingredients outlined will behave as soon as they begin to be processed. Otherwise, it can be very difficult to figure out how to use them, work with them, and even sell them. In any food manufacturing process, it is critical to understand how the ingredients being used are going to behave as they are heated, emulsified, homogenized, and so on. Not just individually, but also how they will interact with the other ingredients. There are no standard universal methods for determining functionality in dairy powders in the same way that there are for uh, measuring moisture, protein, and sugar, for example. Companies tend to have their own general tests, as well as application tests that are unique to their products. In this webinar, we're going to concentrate on six key functional characteristics of dairy products, and these will cover the majority of what defines the functionality of dairy ingredients. In this slide, we've listed the six key functional characteristics we want to discuss. Emulsification, foaming whipping, stability, gelation, viscosity, and browning. The strength of these six functional char characteristics varies between the different dairy products. And understanding these differences is the key to determining which ingredients are suitable products to use in any given application. Here at the CDR, we routinely carry out functionality tests across these and other attributes, and we use our practical and scientific expertise to advise companies in their manufacture, their product development, troubleshooting, and innovation programs. For the purpose of this webinar, though, we limit our presentation to just these six attributes across the product range discussed, as it will give you a good understanding 
of what we mean when we talk about the functionality of dairy products. So we begin our discussion on functionality by taking a look at emulsification. And here we're looking at the ability of emulsifiers, specifically our dairy products, to act as a stabilizer uh, in stabilizing oil and water emulsions. If you look at uh, an oil and water mix, we are through processing able to disperse the oils throughout the uh, water, thereby creating a nice homogeneous mix. However, over time they will separate. Where dairy products are able to function is by interacting with both the oil and water to create a stable emulsion. They're able to do this because dairy proteins have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties, which means they can interact with both oil and water and thereby create a stable emulsion. Now the dairy proteins present in dairy products differ in their capacity to act as an emulsifier. So being able to quantify that capacity is important for manufacturers. A good example of dairy proteins behaving as emulsifiers can be seen in products such as Alfredo sauces. The dairy proteins interact with the water and the oil to create a smooth, homogeneous sauce. If free oil can be seen in the sauce, it typically donates a, a problem. For those of you with a more culinary bent, we would describe this issue as have it, the sauce having been broken. Another thing to consider with emulsification is that milk in its natural state is an emulsion. The fat globules within milk are encompassed by a membrane called the milk fat globule membrane, which helps prevent lipophilic attack on those ends or on the fat globules, which will break them down or cause off flavors, as well as uh, suspend the fat in milk's colloidal solution. If you let raw milk specifically sit in a fridge for a day or two, the fat will float to the top and form a cream layer. Uh, one way we prevent that within uh, the fluid milk industry is by using homogenization, which Melissa discussed. That breaks down the fat globules into smaller particles. Uh, with those smaller particles, uh, that milk fat globule membrane is disrupted and it leaves more surface area where fat can interact with other proteins. So the protein type that you're using to emulsify is a very important thing to consider um, if you're using emulsification in your final application. The second functionality we're going to talk about today is the ability of dairy proteins to uh, be whipped or to form foams. Dairy proteins are very effective at generating and stabilizing structure in foods. And it's this functionality that offers both a visual and sensorial benefit in those foods that use them. In this particular instance, from a technical perspective, we say that the dairy proteins are able to incorporate air into a micelle that is relatively stable. How much air and the stability of that micelle is very much dependent upon the type of dairy protein used, as well as the other ingredients and processing methods involved. We do say that the, uh, the my cell formation is similar to that of an emulsion, not quite exactly the same, but similar. And some examples would be a whipped cream, a meringue, or a frothy coffee or cappuccino. As anyone has ever been to a coffee shop will, will recall, this is the type of scene that you see as the milk is being foamed uh, and generating eventually, hopefully, a very pleasing and appetizing type product. And again, this is just another example of how Dairy, with its functional properties, delivers those sensorial attributes in the final product. In this slide, we see a demonstration that illustrates the differences between the various dairy products and their ability to form a foam. We subjected different protein uh, products, a 10% uh, protein solution each, to high shear in order to generate a, a foam. Uh, the foam that is generated is due to denaturation of the protein itself. And from this image, you can see that it's clear that the higher protein content powders have a better foam and that the whey protein uh, products are also significantly better at foaming than casein. It's a clear illustration of the relative differences in stability between the two protein types. For this image here, we do have a demonstration in our supporting material is a short video that goes into the depth of the procedure that is used to produce these foams, as well as uh, some important factors to consider with foaming. Uh, foaming can be a negative detriment if you're trying to rehydrate the powder within a tank and you're, and you're recirculating, uh, getting that 
powder incorporated into water and your tank starts foaming over, you're going to be losing protein to the floor. Also in bottle applications, if you have a very foamy product, uh, it could potentially lead to some underweight bottles. Um, so one very important thing, foaming can be good in some specific applications such as meringue or whip products, but it can be ne very negative attribute. And targeting the specific protein that you need for that application is very important. So next up, we'll take a look at maybe a, a less commonly understood uh, mechanism, especially amongst consumers, and that is the ability of dairy to, to brown uh, in, dairy, in food products. Uh, lactose is the primary uh, ask driver of this uh, issue in dairy products. Uh, it's the primary sugar present in milk. It's found in almost all dairy powders. Chemically, it's known as a reducing sugar, which means that it's capable of reacting with other molecules and in doing so, undergoing certain physical changes as well. In the case of lactose, that means it can turn brown in the presence of heat and proteins, a process we call a Maillard reaction. And if we look at that from a little bit more detail, we can see it's a rather complicated uh, chemical process. Uh, but this being a dairy fundamentals course, we'll stick with maybe the more uh, practical aspects of this, which is where it can be beneficial often yielding a pleasant brown caramel-like flavor. And this effect is often deliberately driven to generate some of the sensorial uh, aspects that we desire in a food, the color of cakes, caramel sauces, etc. However, this browning tendency can also be a major defect in some products. And great care has to be taken to control the rate of brown, browning when storing dairy powders. Temperature, heat, and humidity need to be carefully controlled during storage and typically are specified within the original specification I would have showed you earlier. Next we come to talk about viscosity. The viscosity of a food product is determined by many factors including the solids content, particle size distribution, etc. And when all of these come together in, a, in the final food product they deliver the desired sensorial attributes. Dairy powders are a key tool in controlling the viscosity of food products. As both the casein and whey proteins, lactose, etc., they can behave differently and also be processed to further control their functionality in solution. Typically, through heat treatment, the proteins can unfold and expose additional water binding sites, leading to increases in viscosity. And by the same process, proteins can be denatured, resulting in less water binding and lower viscosities. If we look at milk, for example, uh, has a relatively low viscosity, uh, all the way through to maybe a Greek yogurt type product, which has a much thicker, richer viscosity. And it's by manipulating these particular uh, aspects of dairy products, we're able to deliver different sensorial properties. Gelation in dairy products is typically associated with whey proteins. As a result, many whey products utilize WPC as a way to increase both the protein content and bind water, as well as creating texture via heat-induced gelation. Dairy products differ in their ability and mechanisms of action uh, in the formation of gels, while whey proteins are more susceptible to heat-induced gelation and denaturation, which makes them both ideal candidates for delivering gel structure in food products but also means they can be monitored closely during processing to ensure they do not cause issues such as we mentioned browning, burning, etc. The image here shows you some examples of the types of gels that are formed under different pHs. And this gives you another indication of how dairy can be manipulated to deliver specific functional attributes. So why does heat matter when it comes to gelation in dairy products? The heat itself can cause gelation. A good analogy to use is that of egg albumin. Uh, albumin is the water-soluble portion uh, uh, of the egg, but when heat treated, it turns into an insoluble mass. In dairy products, the whey proteins also denature in the presence of heat. They can then interact with each other, uh, other whey proteins, sorry, uh, to form a gel, or in the presence of casein micelles, the whey proteins can induce the casein micelles to aggregate themselves, thereby causing sedimentation or gels as well. All of this is further affected by the pH of the food system. And when it comes to pH, dairy proteins again exhibit, exhibit varying degrees of functionality. 
whey proteins, for example, are commonly used in drinkable yogurts where their uh, proteins remain soluble at lower pHs. Another very important thing to consider with why heat matters is you're going to want to have a great understanding of the processing history or heating history that your dairy ingredient that you're going to utilize in your final application has gone through. Um, for example, if you're going to use non-fat dry milk or a milk protein concentrate within a cheese application, you're going to want to have the full functionality of that casein. You're not going to want to have that whey protein denatured onto that casein. So respectively, you're going to want it to go through lower heat treatment that the whey protein hasn't been effective. For example, a low heat um, non-fat dry milk would be better, best for that type of application. While if you consider a high heat product, um, bakery applications would be a great example of that. You're going to want to have those disulfide regions within your whey protein exposed so they can bind more water as well as interact with your casein so they can have a higher water binding capacity as well as create a better foam within the final finished good. So understanding the heat that your dairy ingredient has gone through is very critical. So let's take a quick look at how pH can affect solubility. Whey proteins are soluble across a, across a wide pH range, and particularly so at lower acidic values. Caseins, on the other hand, are not. They have an isoelectric point of 4.6, which means that below this pH value, the casein proteins will precipitate and come out of solution. You will have seen the same effect if you have ever let your milk out for too long and it went sour. And this particular image here on the screen shows you a, a, a milk protein isolate at various pHs. We can see at pH 7, it's a nice homogeneous mixture. At pH 4.6, those proteins are on the edge. They're about ready to, to fall out of solution. Uh, some have already begun to do so. But at pH 3, we have a mass that really is liquid and a solid mass. When we look at whey, for example, though, we see a different situation. Across the pH range, the whey proteins are still soluble. So what does this mean? You will have seen the same effect as I mentioned earlier, if you've ever let your milk out for too long and it went sour. On the left is an image of what that might look like for, let's say, a whole milk type product. You have the casein on the bottom, you've got the liquid whey, uh, and lactose in the center, and on the top you've got the fat-based uh, portion of the milk. And then the other image typically shows what happens when you've left the milk out for too long and you pour it out. You get this uh, liquid and solid mass exiting the, your, your, your milk carton. The solid mass is the casein portion, the liquid part is the whey coming out. So having gone through a quick overview of the six main functionalities, let's talk a little bit about what factors are responsible for determining the overall functionality of any given dairy product. Well, there are three main factors. Uh, it's composition, it's processing history, and of course, it's age. The processing history tells us about the origins of the product and how it has been processed. The source of dairy can be very important for example, whey sourced from various cheese manufacturing processes can vary in flavor and slight degrees of comp uh, composition. While the subsequent processing, such as uh, heat treatment, filtration, shear, and so on, will have a profound effect in the finished dairy product. The age of an ingredient is also important. We've already seen how over time dairy powders can undergo age-related changes such as browning, and also where improper storage can lead to other issues such as off flavors and clumping. However, the composition of a dairy product is the primary factor that determines functionality and performance in application. The protein composition in turn is the primary contributor of that functionality. And casein and whey proteins uh, are the majority proteins found in dairy and the differences between them are simultaneously the reason behind dairy's wide performance range as well as some of the potential issues that can be caused. Let's take a closer look at casein and whey. This slide here illustrates the differences between these two types of proteins. You could almost say that where one is strong, the other is weaker and vice versa. And generally, caseins are heat stable, good emulsifiers and insoluble under acidic conditions. Whereas whey proteins are heat sensitive, 
they're okay emulsifiers and they're soluble under acidic conditions. When we look at the composition of the various dairy powders, we can see a link between their composition and their functionalities. Products that contain casein tend to be better emulsifiers and have better heat stability than those that don't. Whey protein products are better foamers, they're more pH stable than their casein-based powders. So the table in this slide outlines the general relative functional characteristics in relation to composition. We can now look at this table in a little more detail and kind of understand how the composition of the final product affects its functionality. If we're looking at foaming, if you remember from the demonstration, our whey proteins had our best foaming capability, as well as you need a product that has protein or higher protein content that can foam. So our higher protein products, such as our MPC, WPC, and WPI, have better foaming capabilities, as well as the product with high whey protein content, which has our highest foaming capability. Um, our WPC and our WPI have more foaming capabilities. If we're looking at emulsification specifically, our higher protein content products, once again, have better emulsification capabilities. Um, our milk protein concentrate with its higher composition or distribution of whey to casein, um, that's at its native 80% casein, 20% whey, has the highest emulsification capability, while our whey protein concentrates, which are have a high protein content, do have uh, emulsification capability as well. If we look at heat stability, our products with casein, as well as higher, have higher heat stability, such as our non-fat dry milk and milk protein concentrate. You can remember back that our whey proteins do not have heat stability within their structure. For browning, we're gonna look at products that have higher lactose content. Our non-fat dry milk, as well as our sweet whey powder, have the highest capability for browning. Our whey protein concentrates, if you have, use a lower protein content, whey protein concentrate that has a higher um, lactose concentration. It can have a capability of doing some browning as well. So we've seen how different dairy products vary in composition and how those differences manifest themselves in their functional properties. The dairy industry is able to go further and develop unique products with specific functionalities to meet the demands of consumers, whether it be the need for a higher protein content in beverages, a zero lactose, lactose content in bakery or modified fat content in sauces, the industry can apply multiple processes to generate a product with the desired properties. This can be done by modifying the composition, heat treatment, or enzyme modification of lactose or proteins that are present. So now let's turn our attention to how the functionality of dairy products is applied to food and beverages. When looking at the application of dairy powders, it's best to talk a little bit initially about some of the practical tips and what to look out for when starting out with, with uh, utilizing dairy products. And the key issue with dairy powders always begins with solubilization. Incomplete solubilization will lead to major issues further down the processing line, so great care should be taken to avoid this. Higher protein content products need to be more careful uh, in their hydration. Too much shear, for example, can denature your whey proteins, uh, resulting in loss of functionality. One good example is never to hydrate powders in, in any water that's too hot. Uh, for example, if you, if you do this, you tend to get what we call fish eyes, where little uh, spheres of protein will... I don't... As we mentioned earlier, the functionality of any dairy ingredient is, is arguably the most critical attribute to consider when selecting which ingredient to use. There are some other aspects of the ingredients to take into account, such as availability and cost. Uh, both of these are driven by market forces. Dairy ingredients are volatile at times, and the demand for one dairy product can influence the price and availability of others. The processing of components are interrelated in that milk, for example, is separated into skim and cream, and then further processed into a myriad of end products, including cheese, other milk powders, cream, lactose, etc. An increase in the demand for any one of these particular products 
will have a knock-on effect on the others. Thus, if cheese prices increase, whey powder, whey powder prices might fall due to overproduction followed from increased cheese manufacture. Dairy manufacturers, uh, product developers, and sales teams need to be aware of market conditions to plan accordingly. We'll begin our look at the use of various dairy powders and applications by uh, starting with non-fat dry milk. And when we look at non-fat dry milk, there are three main types which are defined by the temperature at, at which they are processed. And these typically are low heat, medium heat, and high heat. And these products are available to tailored specific applications. And the slide here outlines the main categories that make use of NFDM. And you can see that they're very varied. The nutritional, flavor, and functional aspects of non-fat dry milk are what make it so versatile across the, this range of products. We see non-fat dry milk providing structure and flavor to bakery and confections. Uh, they're essential uh, to the stabilization of air micelles and ice cream. We see them in natural cheeses where the casein proteins are required to deliver the characteristic flavors and structure. While in processed cheese, those dairy proteins uh, are able to be used to control the performance of the cheese itself. And even in meat products, we see where dairy proteins are used as a way to provide extra texture as well as water binding capacity. Milk protein concentrates share many of the same food applications as non-fat dry milk, but they really come into their own with the more value added product categories. Their superior protein content is much desired uh, but it also ensures that they deliver extra functionality in products such as Greek yogurt where texture is paramount. Dietary supplements, sports nutrition, and weight management products take full advantage of the functional properties uh, in milk protein concentrates to ensure products do not have, have, sorry, do not have to compromise on taste and texture as they deliver the nutritional aspects that consumers are looking for. When we look at whey powders, we understand uh, as well that whey powder is a very cost-effective ingredient, but it also finds ubiquitous use across food applications due to its own inherent functional attributes. It enhances sweet and savory flavors and also can be an integral part of color development, especially in confectionery and beverages. Its low viscosity compared to other dairy ingredients ensures a lighter texture in many applications. Moving to higher protein products, uh, whey protein concentrates and isolates, isolates typically greater than 90% protein, we see that they provide excellent functional attributes while simultaneously delivering nutritional demands. The functional differences between the casein and the whey proteins means that some applications are more suitable for caseins and others for whey type products. When we look at fortified drinkable yogurts, for example, MPCs and MPIs would not make suitable sources of of protein as caseins are insoluble and will gel at lower pHs. Whey proteins, on the other hand, are still soluble at lower pH and consequently able to deliver the desired viscosity for a drinkable type product. And again, this slide is illustrating the variety of products that make use of those whey protein concentrates and whey protein isolates. A broader look at the usage of dairy powders. In this slide, we're illustrating some details published by the American Dairy Products Institute. The various graphs show the relative domestic usage of dairy products by market category from 2013 to 2019. And all the dairy product products powders that we're discussing here are used across common markets such as back into the dairy industry itself, as well as bakery products. There are some notable differences, however, when it comes to the more value added products such as infant formula and nutritional food and beverages. In these sectors, we tend to see the higher protein dairy powders dominate, specifically due to their nutritional benefits. But once again, their usage in these uh, particular sectors is supported by the fact that the functionality that we've already described uh, ensures that these products can deliver the high degree of sensorial attributes that consumers demand. So now let's take a closer look at some of the applications that use dairy products. Ice cream, for example, is a product that is regulated by the Code of Federal Regulations in that it is required to have a minimum amount of dairy solids. 
the dairy solids use are typically non-fat dry milk and cream, and they align with some of the whey products together to provide the structural properties that deliver desired flavor, color, and mouthfeel characteristics. These properties are also made use of throughout other frozen desserts, ensuring consumers have a wide selection of products to choose from. We see the same use of functionality in bakery products, where whey products are extensively used, uh, providing not just by now the familiar flavor and appearance, but they also help to modify crumb texture, uh, as well as uh, helping with moisture retention. Dairy product functionality is able to respond to issues with other ingredients. Uh, we'll talk about later on, but for example, whey-based products are used widely to replace eggs, uh, driven by volatility in that particular market. So we see here a list of the whey's, WPC's, and the various familiar functionalities that they bring to these particular uh, bakery applications. Dairy products are also found across the confectionery market, again providing color, sweetness, viscosity control, texture, flavor, everything that a confection needs. Whether it's chocolate, toffee, icings, etc., the range of sensorial attributes are the result in large part of the range of functionalities that are displayed by the dairy components. Confectionery applications also afford us an opportunity to highlight the differences between dairy products. If we look at milk chocolate, for example, we see how non-fat dry milk or whole milk powder is used extensively to deliver the flavor and performance expected. However, this doesn't work too well if you try to use a whey or whey protein concentrate. The proteins and lactose content here have a detrimental effect on the textural properties of chocolate. And as such, they have a limited application across chocolate-based products. While it might not seem obvious to most consumers, dairy products are used extensively in the processed meat sector. Whey protein concentrates and whey protein isolates predominate in this market, and their particular functionalities make them ideal ingredients for processed meats. Solubility, for example, over a wide pH range is a critical aspect in the preparation of brine solutions used for meat injection. As, as water binding agents, uh, the whey products are able to affect the textural properties of the meat, reduce cooking losses, and ensure a consistent end product. Also, as the whey proteins are able to form gel structures, this improves the adhesion properties of the meat itself especially useful in products such as ham, sausages, and chicken nuggets, where the, the dairy powders not only help pull the product together, but they also improve the adhesion of batters and coatings for fried products. Similar to the previous applications, dairy products are also found across the condensed products and condiments markets, in applications such as soups, sauces, and gravies. And again, it's across the, the full range of dairy products, whey, uh, with WPCs, MPCs, and permeates. And again, the functionality here really is based around its solubility, its ability to emulsify, uh, not just the, the nutrition and the dairy flavor, uh, and importantly, uh, the ability of these dairy products to, to modify the viscosity and final mouthfeel of products. When it comes to delivering nutrition, uh, manufacturers make good use of dairy's functionality to ensure that nutritional products can still deliver on taste. High protein products typically have a difficult time dealing with taste, texture, and shelf life. But again, it is the dairy portion that is able to mitigate these problems. Dairy can deliver high protein through its uh, milk protein concentrates and milk protein isolates, or its whey protein concentrates and isolates. And these are to be found throughout the various layers in a protein bar. Dairy can stabilize a high protein filling, it can mitigate textural issues in a coating, and it can also provide unique texture through uh, high protein crisps or, or an aerated filling. Given nature's design of, of milk as a, a gross food, it's not surprising to see dairy ingredients feature prominently in the ingredient declaration for infant foods. The dairy products here provide the same functional attributes as other food products, but the specification standards are naturally much stricter and, uh, and consequently these dairy products tend to have more value. Infant foods take full advantage of the functional attributes of dairy 
to ensure that these nutritional benefits are optimized. Thus, products must solubilize effectively, they must have good flavor, and they must be able to deliver stable emulsions that can be easily absorbed by the infant. The ingredient declaration illustrated here shows us some of the dairy products we've met already. non fat dry milk, whey protein concentrate, as well as a few others that we have not discussed, such as lactoferrin and galacto-oligosaccharides. These products also provide nutritional functional benefits that we don't have time to discuss today, but are covered in other CDR short courses. The protein supplement market has likewise exploded with numerous products on the market. The product range covers everything from meal supplements, organic and clean label products, through to beverages and, and diet type products. The examples shown here are just a small cross section of what is available and again made possible by the functionality of each dairy ingredient. Whether it's a whey protein concentrate, an isolate or a milk protein uh, concentrate isolate, uh, we look again at the ability to form that emulsification, uh, sorry, that emulsion, to solubilize well, deliver viscosity, to taste good. Looking at high protein beverages again, but this time on the, uh, the high acid type type products, we, we note that the high acid also deliver a, a thirst quenching aspect. But in order to deliver on both these benefits of high protein and thirst quenching, whey proteins are really the only option given their unique solubility at low pHs, as we mentioned earlier. The range of products you see here, ranging from 15 grams and 500 mils to 40 grams up to in, in 600 mils, uh, very widely varied. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it's the whey protein isolate that has the ability to deliver this. So then when we look at the uh, neutral pH or lower acid uh, high protein beverages, we see they have a wider pool of products to choose from. So in this category, we see both the, the, the casein and waste sources being utilized. Those are the NPCs, uh, milk protein isolates, whey protein concentrates and isolates as well. And again, we see a similar range of protein being developed. Once again, making use of the unique functionality of the proteins involved. So we're seeing a lot of versatility uh, and maybe time for just one more example that I touched on previously. Many of you will recall the bird flu back in 2009, which amongst other things caused a shortage of eggs across the country. So a lot of food companies scrambled, if you pardon the pun, to find an alternative to egg products that would deliver the same functionality and flavor in their applications. On the bakery side of things, the water binding, heat stability, and color development associated with using whey-based products positioned whey protein concentrate as an ideal ingredient to assist with replacing eggs across the range of uh, bakery products. Here at the CDR, we developed formulations to demonstrate how WPC could be a cost-effective solution to the problem at hand. There are many flavor and textual, specif textual specifications to be delivered, but the attached image illustrates how whey protein concentrate was able to deliver the required internal structure in bakery applications. So to summarize this section of the course, dairy powders are used across a wide array of food and beverage products. They possess excellent, excellent nutritional qualities and also a wide range of functionalities that make them ideal ingredients in the preparation of food and beverage products across all market sectors. The dairy products manufactured by the U.S. dairy industry are very high quality, as exemplified by their use across multiple markets, including the valuable infant nutrition and pharmaceutical industries. It is important for food scientists, manufacturers, and sales teams to understand the functional attributes of the products they are working with. And finally, working with dairy ingredients will ensure that you'll be able to deliver clean label products with excellent nutrition supported by superior functional properties. So thank you for your attention today. Uh, if there are any particular topics or questions you have in relation to this presentation, please feel free to reach out to us here at the Center for Dairy Research and we will be glad to help you in any way we can.